All right, uh, welcome to your Thursday evening dose of astronomy. I'm Irene Pease, and tonight we're going to take a look at some globular clusters. <laughs> so thanks for joining. Um, I'm part of the Amateur Astronomers Association in New York, and tonight I'll be using software, uh, both open space, which you can find at openspaceproject.com, that's what you're seeing in the background right now is some open space visualization. And then also I'll be using Stellarium, which apparently you can find at stellarium.org, not stellarium.com, like I've been saying. So yeah, try stellarium.org if the stellarium.com wasn't working for you. <laughs> um, so tonight, as usual, I like to start off with uh, the Stellarium and uh, just taking a view uh, seeing what we have in our in our night sky. So we'll pop over to Stellarium. And I like to start off in the west. Uh, there's like this fascinating thing happening behind this tree. I keep using this background because I like these trees, this tree line, um, except I don't like this one tree that's in, uh, that's in this one landscape. So I'm gonna switch to uh, a, a boring landscape. We're just gonna go to the ocean. Um, but I wanted to start off with some trees, so okay. So no more trees. We're out on the water. Great. So get your boat. So tonight there's this kind of neat thing happening. Um, over in the west, the sun is working on setting. So as usual, we're looking at now, now. Uh, this is where we are in eastern time zone, New York City, Brooklyn, to be more specific. And you can start to see a little hint of Venus up there in the sky. Uh, the other exciting thing that's going to be happening as it gets darker and darker and darker, sun sets, Venus will have more contrast, so it'll be easier to pick it out, and oh look, Venus has a little friend. <laughs> so the planet Mercury is also appearing in the sky near Venus tonight, and we can ignore this other stuff for now, just pretend you didn't see that. And uh, a lot of people are going to be looking out later, so actually right around the time this ends, I'm going to try to remember to remind you, because it'll also be a ri reminder of myself, to go outside. Uh, if you haven't been outside today, go outside and uh, look for Venus and look for Mercury. So Mercury tends to be one of the more elusive planets that we can see with the unaided eye without a telescope because it's so stinking close to the sun. So because it's the closest planet to the sun as it's zipping around in its orbit, it never gets too far away from the sun in our sky. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, so it doesn't get nearly as bright as Venus or even Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, actually, I don't remember how bright Saturn gets, but it's definitely not as bright as Venus or Jupiter. Um, and then you're only going to see it right after sunset, so kind of in the glow of the sun, or just before sunrise, so in the glow of the sun again, but on the other side. So uh, it's easiest to see Mercury when it's at what we call its longest elongation, basically it's farthest away from the sun in the sky, has the greatest angular displacement from the sun in the sky. And that's going to be happening uh, in just over a week. I believe the, the longest elongation is actually July, just kidding, June 4th. Um, wrong way. <laughs> so if we fast forward a little bit, um, even next week, when you hear from me, I'll probably say something about it again, or I don't know, maybe I'll just skip it. I'll just assume that if you, if you haven't seen it yet, you're not going to see it. Um, so it'll, g it'll get higher in the sky um, relative to um, other things there. But, um, but it'll be, it's always easier when you have like a brighter target. So I think in the past I've talked about using the moon as a marker to help you find Venus or Jupiter during the day. Well, for our evening time and trying to spot Mercury, it can be useful to use Venus as a marker. So Venus is, again, that really ridiculously bright thing that you really can't miss uh, unless there's you know a tree or a building in the way. Um, and then Mercury is going to be the not so bright thing nearby. So if you can safely go outside and check that out um, after the stream tonight or really any time up until this is again, this is like nine o'clock that we're showing here um, in this view. So that's exciting. It's in like all the newspapers and everything. So I'm like, oh, I guess I should talk about that so that they think I know I, what I'm talking about because if it's on the news, then it must be important. Um, yeah. So later on at 10 o'clock when it's finally dark-ish, 
uh, depending on where you are, what kind of light pollution you have, you'll be able to see stars. And last time I pointed out a few things. We took a little trip using the Big Dipper, which was way overhead, up by what we call the zenith, like way psh, overhead. And so we're going to review that because it's going to be really important for finding the next thing. So if you have a really clear, really low southern horizon, like if you're on the beach or something, um, this is a very exciting thing for you to try to find. So reviewing, there's the Big Dipper. So you'd have to be looking like straight up and bent over backwards to see this facing south. But you follow the arc of the handle because you're arcing to Arcturus, the really bright star, slightly reddish hue. I know it doesn't look really red in here, but I promise it's, it's slightly orange this, um, in the sky. So you arc to Arcturus, and then you speed on to Spica. So Spica is kind of a blue-white, really blue is hard to see, but you know it's a, it's a brighter star. So you're kind of following that curve around, arc to Arcturus, speed on to Spica. Spica is a, the bright star in the constellation Virgo. So we looked at the Virgo galaxy cluster last time. But I want you to see where Spica is relative to due south. Okay, so right now, 10 o'clock local time, um, or 10 o'clock, yeah, in uh, Eastern time, Spica is pretty close to being due south. So I'm going to introduce a little terminology. I don't really like doing that too much in these because it's trying to keep it short and sweet. But fun word for the night is going to be meridian. So I'm going to turn on a line. One of our markings begins with M, meridian. So what is this line? Well, it's green. Okay, yeah, no color doesn't really matter in here. Um, at least not these lines and things. So the meridian is the line that runs from due north to due south, basically just between north and south, and it passes over the point exactly overhead, which we call the zenith. So uh, over the course of the evening, as the Earth is turning, we see stars rising in the east. They'll transit the meridian and they'll set in the west. So whenever a star crosses the meridian, that's the highest that it's going to be in the sky, and then it starts getting closer to the horizon again. So that's, that's why that meridian is, is important. So that's why we're going to be using it tonight uh, to follow Spica. Uh, all those names for Spica. Wow. I was just, imagine having all those names. They get confusing. So you're following uh, Spica as it gets to the meridian. So let's watch, following through time. Oh, that's pretty close. That's close enough for government work to get to the meridian. And then I'm going to turn on um, those blobby things again. Oh, blobby things. So remember way back over here, we had the, the yellow dotted circles. And I said that those were open clusters. So you see beehive cluster, broken heart cluster, shoe buckle cluster. Okay. Um, the Christmas tree cluster, that's a nice one. So these are clusters of stars. These are groups of uh, relatively young stars that all kind of form from the same cloud of gas. They're a little bit closer to us um, and less populated than these other clusters. So you see this is a cluster as well, but it's not the dotted line, that's the open one. The ones with the cross in them, those are globular clusters. And this one is, that's not a W, that's a Greek letter omega. I know it looks like a W, um, but trust me. So that's Omega Centauri, send short for Centauri. So Omega Centauri is one of the brightest globular clusters in the whole night sky. It's generally thought of as a southern object and, you know, looking that it's like really far in the south, you can tell why. <laughs> so if we were trying to find it from, from New York, if I just fast forward, actually we'll rewind first. So I rewind, whoa, and yeah, it just, it never gets very far above the horizon here. So this is going back to, well, sunset-ish. This is like yeah, a little bit earlier in the evening, so nine o'clock. Um, and if I just fast forward, that's 10, 11, and by 11.30 or so, it's probably set already. So it's so far south that we can barely see it at this latitude. If you live further south or if you visit um, down in Georgia, Florida, keep going south, um, it'll be higher in the sky, so easier to see. But we see that it's as high as it's going to be in the sky right when Spica is on the meridian. 
Okay, so when Spica looks really, really high, when it's really far in the south, that's when you want to look for Omega Centauri. And why am I going on about Omega Centauri? Okay, so I swear like every other week I mention globular clusters and how glorious they are, and I'm like, I'll talk about it another time. Well, right now is that other time. So I'm going to kind of zoom in, and this is like a uh, washed out image. But if we didn't, we're looking through like three layers of atmosphere because it's right practically on the horizon. So we have a lot more atmosphere that we're looking through. If you just hold your breath and turn off the atmosphere, whoa. Okay, tell me that's not glorious. That's just amazing. So, <laughs> so that's one of the brightest. So this one and also uh, 47 Tucana or 47 Tuck. Those are both in the southern sky. 47 Tuck we absolutely cannot see from this latitude. You definitely have to be further south to see that. But Omega Sen does skim the horizon um, from 40 degrees north. So that's exciting. So if you have a really clear southern horizon, fun thing to go look for. Definitely fun. If you don't have a clear southern horizon, oh look, there's a few more of them. So there's my favorite one. Um, no, the right one's not my favorite. A little more personality than that. But um, we're going to look... All these, these are open, 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 open. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Um, we're going to fast forward to later in the evening to when the, the best, it's, it's really the best one, when the best globular cluster comes up. Um, so here it's labeled the Pegasus cluster. Some people call it the, uh, uh, the sugar cube because if I turn on just some of these constellations. Um, so this is Pegasus. So it's actually right between two horses. So this is Equilus, the little horse. It's just like a faint little trapezoid of a constellation. And then this is Pegasus, the winged horse, which is a little bit bigger, um, more interesting constellation. But some people say it looks like a little sugar cube that the horse is about to eat. So I think that's really cute. Um, I also like to call it the Christina cluster because alliteration is just like, you know, a lot of fun. Um, so we can zoom in there. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Let's get rid of the yellow thing. Oh, yeah, it's still a little thing. Oh, better. Okay. So I really like this cluster because it has, it's not the biggest, it's not the brightest, but it has this super, super dense core. Um, it really stands out, has, you know, just that a little extra personality and uh, it's probably uh, a black hole causing some of that. And also it has a, a nebula in there. It's the, the Ps1 nebula. Uh, not named after me, but uh, someone just happened to have the same name. <laughs> uh, but that's the first uh, planetary nebula discovered within a globular cluster. So a couple of reasons why it's my favorite, because I know you really wanted to know that. Anyway, um, that one looks really nice in binoculars. If you have, if you go to like Sky Maps with an S, skymaps.com, and just look on there, they'll show you where some of these other um, really beautiful globular clusters are going to be and I'll point more of those out in the in the night sky as we get more into the summer but for now I could use some open space so let's go ahead and pop over to open space opening up all right open space so I do want to take a just a closer look at uh, that globular cluster M15 uh, the sugar cube or whatever you want to call it and um, and yeah, and then kind of zoom out and see where that is in the in the universe <laughs> in our galaxy. So it is part of our galaxy. Globular clusters are some of the more distant objects that we see that are still in our galaxy um, because they tend to be a bit above and below the plane of the galaxy, which we'll see in a little while. Um, and I'm just kind of looking around, might need a marker so let me turn on some constellation lines just to get oriented constellations and uh, we'll talk more about the zodiacal constellations next week I had a request to take a closer look at some of those and um, how they relate to our solar system and stuff which I love talking about so I'm really excited to to look at that more next week but for now, let me try and find where we're headed this way. Yeah, okay. So just to make things simpler, I'm just gonna uh, do this thing where I just turn off the Earth. <laughs> Wave goodbye to the Earth. It'll it'll come back. 
it's still actually there because you might have noticed you didn't just like pop into space. I mean, you're in space, but yeah. So way over there somewhere is uh, is the uh, globular cluster M15. And you might recognize Pegasus, Equilus. Remember I said Equilus was like a little trapezoid. Um, but I want to go ahead and see if we can't view it in here because it's kind of just a fun effect. So one of the fun things in open space is they have images of a lot of these quote unquote deep sky objects. So clusters, galaxies, nebulae. And if you look in just the right direction, it's almost like you're, this is, this is, this is my, my version of kind of like looking through binoculars or looking through a telescope. So we're gonna point ourselves towards M15 and then we're just gonna kind of look in closer and you can just holler when you see it. Point and laugh. Whoa. Okay. Star. Whole bunch of stars. So yeah. So these globular clusters, like a whole mess of stars. Like I, I do. I like to call them just like this big ball of sparkle. So that's um, that's our image. A little bit clearer than we had, I think, in, in Stellarium. But just another really nice image of M15. In all its glory. <laughs> so lots and lots of stars in there. So globular clusters tend to have anywhere from a few hundred thousand to a million or more stars. Um, this one, it's uh, what is about, yeah, it's, it's several hundred thousand. So it's over half a million stars. So it is one of the smaller ones, but, uh, but it's got that really bright core. And again, so probably a black hole, which is great, right? That counts for like at least a half a million stars because black holes just have cool points. Um, that's not really how astronomy works, but we're gonna pretend. So I'm gonna come back to kind of like our regular view here. Um, and I forgot what I was doing next. Oh yeah, and then we'll actually zoom out to um, yeah, let's zoom out to the galaxy um, and just see our see our cluster there. So we can actually, yeah, I'm gonna try this. So I actually did a little proper layer, <laughs> uh, maybe more than usual. Uh huh. And. Uh, and wait for it okay yeah so let's see if we can't zoom out to m15 and wrong way nope go yeah this should be getting us there I don't see it. Okay, so I'm gonna. So I know it's there, <laughs> um, and I promise that's actually where I want to be. So we'll go ahead and turn on all the yellow dots that should be globular clusters. So this globular cluster, this one that's in the center, that yellow spot, um, these are markers of where all of our known uh, globular clusters in our galaxy are. And I'm just gonna set that rotating a little bit. So our galaxy doesn't have nearly as many globular clusters as some other galaxies. Um, we're looking at only about 150 or so, 150, 160. And whereas other galaxies might have, well, a whole lot more. But what I wanted to look at was, well, if we were in this globular cluster, I'll move away from it a little bit what would our night sky look like? So you saw all those stars in there. I'm actually gonna turn those off. Um, wait. So you saw all the stars that we had, um, the half a million stars, all kind of crammed together. So they're, um, they're only about like 80,000, know, just kidding, about 90 light years across. So that's not very big, like 90 light years, 
that's there, there's not even I mean there's there's a lot of stars within 90 light years of us but not like you know half a million um, sorry 90 light years in in radius so twice that uh, in diameter but imagine having like all those stars in your night sky and then on top of that you have this glorious view of the galaxy like you're way up above the way up above the the plane of the galaxy kind of looking down on it whereas here on earth we're kind of in the in this in the plane of it um, so just looking in the comments uh, we have is the cluster rotating as a whole or is there apparent chaotic movement around the center or don't we know um, interesting question so I'm not sure I don't I'm pretty sure that it's not completely rotating uh, so it's probably more chaotic than anything else more chaotic than uh, organized if you will like a like a consistently rotating thing um, because there it's a, it's an end body <laughs> many many objects very close together um, just the slightest perturbation would be <laughs> the slightest perturbation would like throw everything off so it wouldn't be very regular um, and also I'm gonna try and move out just a little further also as they they're so the, as a whole, each each one of these, each globular cluster is kind of passing through, it's orbiting around the, the Milky Way as, as we are, um, but it passes through the plane of the Milky Way and gets uh, perturbed, it kind of gets strung out. Um, so I actually want to try to switch. Um, this off. I'm just going to turn this on for now. Um, so as the markers moves a little bit more smoothly. So yeah, so you can see, so pull away a little bit. So you can see kind of the extent of like the, the distribution of these clusters around the Milky Way. So some are, yeah, passing through the plane at the moment. Um, that's always going to be true. But they're way up above and way down below. So they're kind of in this this halo, so to speak, kind of uh, surrounding and still part of the galaxy. So again, that's why there's some of the more distant objects that we see that are still part of our galaxy, because we're not looking through the plane. We're not looking through all that gas and dust and other stuff. Um, we're looking up or down, you know, either way, there's not really up and down in space, but we're looking out of the plane. Um, where there's not instructions, where there's not as much stuff obscuring our view. Um, and these are also, they also tend to be older stars. We're not really sure exactly how they form. So that's, you know, kind of an exciting mystery. So if you want to do research and, you know, figure out how that works, <laughs> that'd be great. I'd love to know. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're mostly clumped together. And then as they pass through the disk, uh, they do get kind of streamed out. And it's not just that they have streams of stars going back behind them. So if we look at some of these, I know there's a few that are uh, much closer to the, to the center of the galaxy, but just from this view here, um, I don't know exactly which way any particular one of these is moving at the moment. But if we just say, uh, maybe this one here just passed uh, in this direction through. So it have a stream of stars leading and lagging it. Not a whole lot, but there would be some um, kind of making it more of a streak. But the, the streak uh, is, is not nearly as bright and not nearly as dense um, as the cluster itself. But there's, there's definitely a, a streak happening there. So yeah, so that's, that's our globular cluster. So happy globular cluster day. And again, if you were in another galaxy, you'd have a lot more globular clusters. So we've, we've been able to see more globular clusters around other galaxies like Andromeda, you know, our, one of our favorite neighbors, um, and other supermassive galaxies like M87, the one with the really, really, really big black hole. Um, way more globular clusters than we do. Does that mean that we're not as cool? No, no, just, I'm not sure what it means, but it is kind of interesting. And, uh, and yeah. So again, the night sky, we just do a night sky from our globular cluster. The stellar density in globular clusters is higher than it is in most other places in the galaxy, except for the galactic core. So if you imagine having, again, like say, one of the, one of the stats they give is around 70 stars per 
uh, per cubic parsec, but no one really knows what a parsec is. Well, some people do, right? So it's parsec is like three and some odd change um, light years. So a cubic parsec comes out to like almost 35 cubic light years. So 75, sorry, I'm doing a bunch of math right now, but 70-ish 70, <laughs> 70 uh, stars in 35 cubic light years, I, I bet I'm pretty sure that boils down to two, <laughs> two stars per cubic light year. Correct me if I'm totally messing that up. But, but yeah, so that it's not that dense. I mean, it's not like all the stars are like right poo -poo on top of each other. Um, but it's a lot more dense than, than our stellar neighborhood, right? So we don't have any stars within one light year of us. Our closest star is, is 4.2 light years away. So much more dense than, than our little neighborhood, which is marked by our constellation lines back there. And we're in the plane of the galaxy, right? So yeah, there should be stars and stuff there. No, but so that's kind of an average towards the core and especially M, uh, M15, which, you know, I think I can just, can I just do this? Nope, other one. <laughs> Save that for another time. Um, the M15 has... Uh, a lot more in its in its core so several orders of magnitude like more like a thousand per cubic parsec instead of on the order of a hundred per cubic parsec so um let me just bring that one up again i have it okay yeah oh wow okay so just all those stars um and then in here i'm just going to pretend i'm pretty sure this is the piece one nebula which is kind of neat so I'm going to go ahead and just take us just take us back home. Um, see if we can't find find home. One of these. Turn off. One of these. And head back home. There's home. Um, so again, uh, your fun things for this week, look for Omega Centauri, which um, is going to be out at a semi-reasonable hour, just really, really far south. So again, if you live near buildings, sorry, <laughs> uh, try next year uh, when you're not, you know, stuck at home or something. But uh, if you can, if you're near the beach or something, go check that out. And then also, as soon as I stop talking, you should run outside and look for Mercury. Um, or you can wait, you know, up to half an hour or so go find mercury in the sky um, that's actually just one last thing i'll point out in here uh, i think i turned off the earth but i turn our orbits back on so we can see where earth is um, since mercury and venus appear near each other in our sky what does that mean about their actual positions relative to earth right now well that means that they should all line up so if we look at the positions of, if I turn off some constellations, we can see this a little bit better. If we, no, not that, <laughs> um, there we go. So if we turn off the constellations, you can look and see, let me turn this, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Yeah, basically along a line. I'm just going to make a line. Mercury, Venus. Sorry, just kidding. Earth, <laughs> Venus, Mercury. Basically along the same line. So as we're looking from Earth, we see Venus and Mercury along the same line of sight uh, tonight. And again, tomorrow night, Mercury is going to be a bit higher above Venus. Uh, it'll still be up there, but tonight they're going to be the closest. So it's probably um, one of the best nights to go out and try and see both of them together. So good luck with that. Uh, next week, if you want to tune in, again, we'll be talking about constellations, uh, especially the constellations of the zodiac and how we can see those um, around the solar system. So thanks for tuning in for your, <laughs> yes, a syzygy. Thank you. <laughs> One of my favorite astronomy words. Thanks so much for tuning in for your Thursday dose of astronomy. Again, I'm Irene Pease with the Amateur Astronomers Association in New York City. And you've been viewing open space and stellarium. Good night.